Many see Britain as we know it, emerging only with the coming of the Romans in 43 AD. However, this ignores the dynamic and complex communities of Britain that have been established since the Stone Age. This video series intends to uncover what life was like for British people thousands of years ago before the Roman invasion and how exactly they lived their lives. The best possible place to begin, therefore, is by establishing who exactly lived here and where, and more importantly, how was power divided on this island? The first way to uncover who lived in Celtic Britain is to consult primary sources. However, we do not have any directly from the British people who did not write anything down. The next best thing is to consult other sources from people who had contact with Britons or who had knowledge of them. The first source that tells us at length of the state of Britain is by Diodorus Siculus in his works of the Library of History. Diodorus says, And Britain, we are told, is inhabited by tribes which are autochthous and preserved in their ways of living in the ancient manner of life. The island is also thickly populated and its climate is extremely cold. It is held by many kings and potentates who for the most part live at peace amongst themselves. Although Diodorus's insight is brief and vague, it still is important as it informs us that Britain was not yet a cohesive nation and instead it was composed of a patchwork of local communities who each had their own ancient customs and rulers. The next writer we can look to to find out more about Celtic Britain is Julius Caesar. Although Caesar did not see the whole of Britain, he witnessed the southern part during his attempted invasion in 55 BCE. This is recorded in his work of the Gallic Wars. Caesar states, The inland part of Britain is inhabited by tribes declared in their own tradition to be indigenous to the island. The maritime part of Britain by tribes that migrated at an earlier time from Belgium to seek booty by invasion. Nearly all of the latter are called after the names of the states from which they sprang when they went to Britain. Caesar's account is important as it suggests that people who lived in Britain were not just those indigenous to the island but also settlers from mainland Europe. However, what makes Caesar's account so important is that it corroborates what Diodorus previously stated. This is useful in our search for Celtic Britain because multiple sources confirm the very localised nature of power at the time divided among various community groups. Caesar even goes on to describe some of these community groups, or tribes as he puts it. He recounts the leader of the rebellion against his invasion, Cassivellaunus, whose territories are divided from the maritime states by the river called the Thames, about 80 miles from the sea. Hitherto, there had been continuous wars between this chief and other states. This places his tribe, the Catabolorni, in southeast England, roughly in the areas of Hertfordshire, Bedfordshire, Cambridgeshire and beyond. Caesar's writings tell us of the tumultuous nature of Britain at the time, with various tribes who vied for power. Although this conflict can certainly be rooted in the coming of a foreign invader, Celtic Britain was certainly a place of warring peoples with borders shifting. This can be seen further in the mentioning of other tribes by Caesar who are not present in any other sources. For example, the Senamagi, the Ankelites, and the Cassi. This could have been an error on Caesar's part, as he could have misidentified tribes, However, some historians have suggested that the lack of mention of these tribes in later sources could have been because they were absorbed into larger power bodies. For example, the Cassi, who could have been absorbed into the Catavallorni, as historian Tom Williamson suggests. This certainly marks Britain as a place of fluid power borders. Caesar's work is particularly frustrating because although he does mention the names of tribes, he does not always offer further information about them. One such example is the Trinibantes. Caesar does offer a few details, such as their king was killed by Cassivellaunus. However, he did not expand on the geographical location of the Trinibantes like he did earlier with the Cassivellaunus. 
This is where another ancient source is particularly useful. Ptolemy's work Geography is perhaps the most comprehensive source in detailing the borders of the different communities in Britain. In fact, a whole chapter of his work is dedicated to the matter. Ptolemy mentions a variety of tribes across the British Isles, from the Novinti of southern Scotland to the Dumnoni of northern Cornwall. The most significant tribes mentioned by Ptolemy include the Trinovantes, who he places in southeastern England, in modern day Essex and Suffolk. He similarly mentions the Catavellauni, who hold the same dominion as Caesar provided us with earlier. Ptolemy also mentions the Iceni, famous for the Boudican Revolt who reside in Norfolk. He also mentions the Balgai, who held dominance over Hampshire, as well as the Brigantes, who many argue were the most powerful tribe in Britain. They had control of the largest landmass, believed to stretch from Durham all the way down to southern Lancashire and southern Yorkshire. Now we have reviewed what the primary historical accounts have to say on the matter of the geography of the Celts, we have discovered two main points. The first, that Britain was not a cohesive country, and instead the island was comprised of local communities who often clashed with each other. The second being, these communities were ruled over by some kind of nobility, possibly kings, queens, princes or chieftains. I'm reluctant to use these words definitively, as readily as the Roman sources do. But are these things really true? because it has to be recognised that these Roman sources are not only written from an outside perspective, but above all, a perspective that is tainted by biases founded on imperial and nationalist principles. We have to recognise the limitations from the likes of Caesar, Diodorus and Ptolemy, who all wrote with their own agenda. Therefore, the best course of action is to examine the archaeological finds of Celtic Britain to see what the Britons can tell us themselves. Whilst it is certainly hard to gauge the spheres of British Celtic tribes using archaeology, it's not impossible. We possess first-hand evidence in the form of coins minted by the Britons themselves. For example, a coin associated with the Iceni tribe was found, dating from 20 BCE to 5 CE. The next coin is from the area of the Kuril Tavi tribe, from around 20 BCE to 20 CE. And the final coin is a Catavellauni coin minted by the king Cassiovanus, the first king to issue coins with his name minted on them. These coins have the extraordinary ability to inform us of the rough bounds of the British tribes. While coins are objects that can easily be transported around past borders, it's still important to remember the symbolism of coins. They only would have retained value as a currency where people believed they held value, likely in the places where they were minted. It also tells us about power in Celtic Britain itself. Thanks to contact with outside forces through trade like the Gauls and Romans, leaders were beginning to find new ways to cement and assert their power in the form of control over currency, which was something Britain had not seen the likes of before. Another useful archaeological source of information about tribes, geography and power in Celtic Britain is the material objects which have been found that suggest there was some kind of elite. For example, the Battersea shield is incredibly ornate. While it probably served ceremonial purposes rather than practical ones, you can't help but imagine this being used by someone who held power in their local community. Another find that is incredibly important is the Snettisham treasure hoard, which housed a variety of great treasure from coins to torques. One of the greatest finds is a gold torque that weighs over a kilogram. Its detailed and hefty ornamentation invoke a clear sense of wealth and authority. It certainly must have belonged to someone who could afford to flaunt it. The shields and torques are physical symbols of power, and they tell us that Britain was a place where people felt the need to show off their wealth physically, possibly to assert their dominance over their tribes through the show of human labour that they could muster. 
Wealth can be linked directly to individuals through burials. In the north of England, in graves part of the Arras type, individuals of high status and often warriors were buried in specific ways, accompanied by willed chariots. For example, the so-called Wet Wang Woman was buried in 210 to 160 BCE with two wheel horse-drawn vehicles and various riches like a mirror. Two other people were buried in a similar fashion in the same site. Whilst this is only a small part of Britain, and burials like this may not have been typical on the whole of the island, it's fair to say that these graves can confidently tell that specific types of people held power in Britain, and it was not just limited in male hands. However, shows of power were not just limited to wealth like gold or great chariots. Having control over food and sharing this amongst the community in itself was a show of power. This is reflected in the archaeological evidence because VCN utensils were found in burials. For example, a fire dog was found in Hertfordshire in Wellen. This suggests that feasting and having control over the food supply was a show of wealth. Because, as Neil Oliver suggests, Social standing was no longer demonstrated by the wearing of ostentatious jewellery or fine swords. It was also about the ability of a leader to draw supporters to his side and keep them there. A chieftain in control of surplus food would therefore be able to use a feast as an opportunity to show his generosity and more specifically to make it clear who was in favour with him and who was not. Power in Celtic Britain was therefore about the illusion in the hands of those who displayed their wealth and projected their authority and control. So, the map of Celtic Britain starts to emerge thanks to the written and archaeological sources. It's a map that is patchy and bloody and completely fractured. Above all, it's a map that was constantly shifting dictated by what tribes held the greatest martial ability, as well as the politically aware elite who through wealth and abundance made people believe they were worthy of the power that they held. Hi there, thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed, please consider liking and subscribing. I also have a TikTok and an Instagram which I will leave linked down below so you can check them out if you want any more content about history. Also, if you have any requests for future videos, then please make sure to pop them in the comments below. Again, thank you so much for watching this video. I have been Our Historia and until next time.